Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, today's webinar. I'm very happy that you all have tuned in. Um, it's been an interesting month. I mean, it's been an interesting run in the precious metals markets over the last little while, and an interesting month that is creating, in my opinion, some really interesting opportunities for those who want to add to their portfolios. And the company that we are uh, going to discuss today is fits that bill, I would say. Um, that's Reina Silver. And I will let Jorge Monroe take you through that story in just a little bit. But first, I am going to uh, take you through my latest thoughts on what's going on in the markets and, uh, and where we're going from here. So uh, here we go. So basically, there's my talk. Precious metals, uh, so many forces, but only one outcome. And so, um, oops, I need to forward my slides. There we go. Um, I wanted to start with just this comment that it's really complicated. Gold is really complicated. And silver moves right alongside gold most of the time in a precious metals market. I think it does its own thing when you're not in a precious metals market. But when you're in a market, it mostly moves with gold. So I'm just going to focus on gold for the next few moments here. So gold, I mean, it... Um, it is a safe haven, so it benefits when people are fl fleeing to safety, but yet it gets hurt by strength in the US dollar, which is another safe haven. It thrives on economic uncertainty, but it also loves economic growth because it loves inflation. There's all these opposing forces going on, right? It's often thought to move against the stock market, but these days it moves with the stock market a lot of the time in these in these QA, QE um, and insane monetary policy days. Um, and I also wanted to, lay out the idea that I think gold's first reaction to a lot of major macroeconomic news is not, so to speak, its real reaction. I think gold initially reacts in relation to bigger markets that have bigger volumes, like the US dollar or the bond market. And then gold's real reaction sort of follows afterwards. Um, and so that can be confusing for those of us who are in the gold space. But the bottom line is if time is on your side, you're not worried about cashing out your portfolio tomorrow or next week, then the details don't matter because the bottom line is that precious metals are going up from here. I'm gonna go through the setup for that. I'm gonna do it reasonably quickly because um, I've certainly been harping on about this for quite a few months now. I'm happy to give anybody more information if they're so inclined. But negative real rates are the most important bull force for gold and we have them and we're gonna have them for quite a long time. So, <clears throat> Um, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Powell, has assured us that we will have negative rates and they will likely even go lower for years. He did that when he changed the inflation target, the official inflation target. He was basically broadcasting, we're not going to increase interest rates and we're going to let inflation run. That means negative rates. Negative rates are what drive gold. And so that's what this slide is about. It goes all the way back through to 2013 and talks about and points out why gold struggled for those years, why gold started to um, perform in 2016 when real rates started to decline there. Then gold struggled again because real rates rose and, and we're looking to be on the upswing again. And then we got into this declining environment. And then we had COVID-19 and things sh dropped through the floor and it put us into a new paradigm. And that's where we are now. Remember that following the last major, major crisis, the great financial crisis, it took seven years for the Federal Reserve to raise rates. So like, I don't know how long it's going to take this time, but that is a reasonable proxy. That's a reasonable sort of timeline to consider. The US dollar, I mentioned before, is another big factor for gold. It had been declining until the last few weeks. And there are reasons to believe that um, the US dollar bull market is at its tail end, um, I think there's in, there's massive inflation expectations. Those have been driving those negative real rates. China has been working ceaselessly for quite some time now to reduce its reliance on the US dollar. There's the ballooning money supply. There's immense debt loads and trade wars haven't are shown to have not been good for the US dollar. And they are just sitting in the sidelines right now because of everything else. But there's a good reason. There's good reason to believe that the US dollar will not act as a headwind broadly through this gold market. It has done so in the last few days, but I don't think it will do so broadly. Then there's the basic fact that gold is the safe haven. I mean, it used to be that large pools of low risk money always bought bonds and bonds would 
provide you with these lovely 6% annualized returns and you could just do that. That setup does not exist anymore. Bonds are the return-free risk, if you want to call them that. They don't pay you anything. And so those large pools of money have had to play the stock market instead. And they've been doing so since you know the monetary world changed in 2009. And they've been doing so with good success. But the risks in the stock market are absolutely real. I mean, this is there's lots of data points you can use to discuss that. Here I'm showing um, U.S. companies with uh, that are filing for bankruptcy and how how we're already outpacing you know other major calamitous years. Um, and I love this tweet. I think I used it in a previous presentation. Imagine buying a bond that yields less than inflation from an extremely leveraged company. That's the case in the U.S. today. Those are the kinds of options that you have, and so you need to diversify your risk in the stock market because the stock market's the only option for you to make money. And so gold is literally one of the only options to do that, and that's why we're starting to see so much generalist, big generalist interest rotate into this space. This um, a bit of a boring slide. I didn't manage to find any pictures to throw on here, but the point here is there's a lot of questions afloat right now. The U.S. election. Um, the COVID situation, what's going to happen to the trade war. This is obviously a quick, very quick summary of some very complicated situations, but I think gold benefits no matter which way any of these things go. And I think that really matters because these events impact the markets. But the setup is such that gold will work no matter what, whether we get inflation and or we get a, more of a setback that requires more stimulus, it ends up being the same thing. Whether we get more trade war um, and the Chinese pushing gold or whether we get less trade war and inflation, it ends up being the same impact on gold. So I think that's another important um, comfort factor for those who are just wanting to be confident in this gold bull market. And then there's you know, the upside ahead in a bull market set up like this is really significant. There's all kinds of metrics that you can look at. You can look at portfolio, portfolio allocations to gold. You can look at gains um, to date relative to past bull markets. We're just getting started. You can look at equity premiums to the price of gold. So what are miners getting um, premiumed at relative to the price of gold? We're, we're nowhere there yet. It just means there's lots of upside ahead and that sort of without even trying to accommodate for the fact that we're in uncharted territories in terms of monetary policy. Okay, so then quickly, why the dip? Why have we had the last month? Uh, why have we had to endure, so to speak, the last month? I mean, there's a few things that happened. One is that Justice Ginsburg died and the impact there is that there was a significant stimulus bill that had almost achieved by bipartisan support. The markets had already accounted for this bill happening and then it evaporated because instead that bipartisan support fell apart in the in the face of this Supreme Court question. And so inflation expectations dipped because where's the stimulus? And the market just generally had a fit and gold got sold off with everything else. Again, gold's real reaction often doesn't happen initially. Gold often gets carried by the overall reaction and then its real reaction comes a little bit later and i think that's what we're seeing now which with gold rebounding already then we also as part of this got a flight to the us dollar in reaction to that lack of stimulus oh no where's the security it's sort of a, a crutch that lots go to and because the euro turned down the euro had been shockingly strong to be honest over recent months but really significantly rising case counts covid case counts in europe um made that case shaky. And so um, since the euro represents 56% of the US dollar index, that supported the dollar. And then it's just the time of year. I mean, September is when traders come back to their desk. A lot of them have been on vacation. A lot of them do a lot of, okay, let's take stock, uh -huh, so to speak. And, uh, and I think there was a lot of um, profit taking and gold was a candidate for that because it had been up really nicely. Now, this is a complicated slide. I'm happy to have long conversations with anybody about this if they're so interested, but there's also this phenomenon where there's been a lot of easy money available in China and a lot of Chinese traders, investors, whether totally inexperienced or highly experienced, have been playing the gold futures market. Now, playing the futures market, playing any futures market can make you a huge amount of money in a short period of time when the market's going up. 
And of course, the market went up so incredibly reliably in the post-COVID boom, and then especially from mid-June until you know the first week of August there, they were raking in the money. It's similar to the Robin Hood phenomenon that we saw in the stock markets here. People saw the market go up, got in, it, it seemed easy, people made a lot of money, but it works until it doesn't. And guess what? Gold turned down and it stopped working. And just like the leverage, the leverage always cuts both ways. Just like how the money was made so easily, it evaporated very easily as well. And so this phenomenon is wrapping up of its own accord. Um, there's both the fact that the price has turned down, a lot, of, a lot of the money is already gone. And so people are exiting those positions. There's also a big market holiday that covers the first nine days of October. So lots of people will close out their positions before that happens. So this added froth and then added volatility. So it added froth on the way up and then real volatility when things turned. And this scenario is wrapping up as well. This was just as significant in silver, by the way, as it was in gold. There were huge future positions in China in silver. And um, in fact, this example that I have here of Kinan is a silver, they, they played the silver futures market um, and made 150 million and then lost all of it like really quickly. And guess what? Now they're not in the futures market anymore. So that's just another thing that is at play. On top of all of this, if you're looking at juniors in the gold silver space, it hasn't been helping that there's this free trading date landslide. Lots of companies raised money in May, June, July. That money all had four month holds on it. Most of it did. Those shares are all coming free to trade September, October, November. And so stocks that are up are going to face, are facing share price pressure because block, big blocks of lower price stock is coming free to trade. In fact, that's a big part of the reason that Reina Silver is such a great buying opportunity right now. Reina is in exactly that boat uh, for no fault of its own. This is just the way that the market is set up. This is how financings happen. And then assay labs have been incredibly slow and there's just profit taking. You can't begrudge investors selling a little when things work after such a long slog. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up fairly soon here, but my message is this bull market is going and you just have to decide what you want to do to take advantage of it. You have to understand the forces enough that you believe it's happening. You have to, and, and then you set up your portfolio accordingly. You have to watch those forces enough that you can see when it starts to change. Now, I don't think that's going to happen for quite a long time, but that's part of the game is just being aware of the big picture. And then you have to decide how much risk you want to take on and how much time you want to commit to your portfolio. Those are the key questions, because the great thing about a gold silver market is that you can have a buy and hold portfolio that you pay almost no attention to, or you can be engaged on daily trading with high risk juniors both of those portfolios will do very well it's just a matter of what you want to do so that is um <clears throat> i'm hearing some background noise there i don't know if you're hearing it but mute themselves um if you want to play the more risky end of things and i wanted to address this as um for a moment because we are talking about reina who is an explorer and so we need to talk about the risk that the risk that's involved in junior exploration um the first thing i want to comment is don't don't think it's easy exploration is not easy there is nothing easy about exploration as the market heats up more and more explorers are able to raise money and so they're able to go out and test targets and so it seems like more discoveries are happening and more discoveries are happening but the odds of success on any one target have not changed and they remain very low and so i think one key takeaway from that is if you're going to invest in an explorer it's a really good idea to focus on those that offer more than one strong target or project or concept because one is likely not going to work. You probably need more. Of course, sometimes the first one works, but a portfolio approach really helps mitigate the risk of failure, um, big picture wise, when you're investing in an explorer. And then you also want to ensure that other risks are in hand. So permits, seasonality, logistics, marketing, these are the kinds of risks that a company has to manage because geology is risk enough on its own. And so you want to demand from management 
their plans for addressing these other kinds of risks and you have to agree that those mean that those risks are managed. I think that is key in <clears throat> feeling comfortable investing in junior explorers. Um, this is a slide that I kept in here. It's from a previous talk. It's about if you're going to play the juniors, you probably need to trade them in and out based on things like free trading dates, things like discovery hits, things like follow-up success and whether that's likely, marketing that might push a price ahead of results, um, seasonality. There's a lot of factors at play in the up and down world of a junior explorer share price chart. So a downtrend isn't necessarily because the project suddenly doesn't work and an uptrend isn't necessarily because the results coming out are gonna be amazing. There's a lot of factors at play. So just if you're gonna play that end of the game, you need to be aware of what those factors are and you need to be following up on them and probably taking action on them. And then, as I said before, it's okay to not want to play that game. You can build a buy and hold portfolio that has large leverage stocks like Barrick Gold, that has scale and growth stocks like Equinox Gold. It's already big, but it's getting way bigger. That has royalty companies in it because they have reliably outperformed in bull, bear, and bull markets since really the sector got started. That has optionality projects. Huge projects are specifically hated in bear markets because they're so expensive. But once a bull market really gets underway, suddenly the very few huge assets that have made progress and are advanced and interesting become the most you know, prized dance at the party because there's hardly any of them out there and majors need those big projects to continue being big in the future. There's takeout or growth, you know, like a, a gold X or like a rocks gold. These are companies that are probably going to do very well in the market if they stay on their own or they may well attract a takeout offer and then there's silver <clears throat> and I could and perhaps should have put together a presentation just on silver but silver is its own beast related to but usually um, generating better returns than gold in a precious metals market and the metal does that and the equities return um, have better returns even more so because there's such a dearth of pure silver stocks out there. And so you wanna make sure you've got that. And then I, I was talking about whether you wanna be a trader or not trader. I think there's a middle ground that I wanted to address here, which is some trading. There are stocks out there that combine good exploration upside with some fundamental growth or some fundamental value. So maybe it's a growing deposit with a mine plan, but lots of exploration excitement. That's fundamental defined value plus the potential for splash. Maybe it's multiple projects and a really strong technical team and good capital markets um, abilities. That means you have a strong lineup of exploration opportunities that's limiting the downside. And also that technical team and that capital markets expertise limits the downside as well. So these are, I, I would call the middle ground. You can get in them. You don't need to pay attention to them every day because that downside is protected, but you can also uh, hope um, with some confidence to get some of that splashy upside that is part of the junior game. And I, I finish with this because I think Reina really fits into this category with their technical team, their capital markets ability, and their huge, their significant portfolio of projects with lots of targets in there um, that are just ready for, for the attention that they're about to get. So this is a choose your own adventure gold bull market. Consider how much focus and risk you want to commit. Build a portfolio that works for you. Stick to your plan and make sure you find a few good sources of information so that you're not sort of lost in the sea of news releases and ideas that is certainly out there. Um, if you would like any more information on uh, the services that I provide to that end, I would be happy to um, help you with that. You can find my website at resourcemaven.ca. And with that, I am going to be quiet for a while. Just before I switch it over to Jorge, I want to say, please ask questions. You can ask questions about anything that I've just said. You can ask questions about anything to do with Raina Silver. There's a questions box there on your control panel, and we will get to those questions just as soon as we've um, gone through Jorge's presentation. Now, oh, there we go. I was looking at every single person who's present on the call and was having fine, trouble finding Jorge, but there he is and I can make him the presenter and away we go. Hi, thank, thanks a lot. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you, yep. 
Great. And can you see my screen as well? Yes. Great. Well, thanks a lot, Gwen. You got a great presentation. And thank you for giving us the opportunity to, to present our company as well. So uh, it's uh, good to, to have everybody here. Thank you for taking the time to listen to our presentation. As, um, as Gwen was explaining, our company is uh, relatively new. We went public only in June of this year. And as she pointed out, we're, at, we're just at the point where the RTO round that had a four month lockup is coming to an end and that's that's going to happen on 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 monday so um i wanted to take an opportunity to to give all of you a, an update as to where we are and for those of you who are new to the to the company i wanted to take the opportunity to to introduce the company so uh, arena silver is a company that originated uh about two years ago i myself put the company together at the time, I was looking for silver uh, silver exploration opportunities, and I approached a number of companies, and one of these companies was Max Silver. And when I spoke to Peter McGall, who's the founder of Max Silver, he mentioned to me that Max Silver had two projects that he himself had, had put together prior to the Max Silver IPO. And I think a lot of you are familiar with Max Silver. Max Silver went public in 2003. And it actually went public on three assets. One of them, the Juanis CPU asset, which is, uh, as many of you know, one of the highest grade discoveries uh, in modern times, and which is about to go into production in the near near future. And then two other assets that Peter had uh, identified that had the qualities of having high grade silver with district scale. And these assets are Gigi and Batupilas, which is uh, the main focus of, of our company and, and what I'll be speaking about uh, today. Both projects, uh, Peter, uh, during the mid 90s and early 2000s had worked, uh, you know, they, they sit in, in major silver districts and Peter had worked on, on making the land package big enough that you could have the potential for a district scale uh, discovery. So, you know, what, what would you like to, what would you want to look at investing in, in our company? We have a portfolio of, of potential high grade silver discoveries with district scale. Uh, the two, our two main properties have had, have had uh, extensive exploration from Max Silver. They spent about $5 million um, US on, on each of the properties. And they both have had uh, drilling with uh, high-grade drill intersects. And um, we have an exploration team that's led by Max Silver's co-founder, Peter McGall, who, as many of you know, has a, an exceptional track record of discoveries. And we have put together a, a team in Mexico of um, people who have worked for Max Silver over the years and who know these type of deposits really well. We also have a VP of exploration who comes uh, with an extensive background um, with Pan American Silver and, and other junior mining companies. And we have a very strong technical advisory board. Uh, management owns about 18% uh, of the company, so there's uh, skin in the game. And we have institutional investors owning over 40% of the company. We also have um, very strong liquidity and a strong balance sheet, we have about 12 million Canadian dollars. And also we we have been receiving coverage from newsletter writers and uh, we hope that soon we'll also start uh, have been covered by some Canadian banks. To tell a little bit about more about our, our technical team, obviously Peter McGall, you know, uh, a number of discoveries, most notably the ones that he has made for Max Silver, but he has also been credited with a geological model for CRD deposits, especially in North America, which has been used as a footprint for a number of discoveries over the years. 
we also have Doug Kerwin, who was one of our early investors. And Doug was part of the exploration team that that um, you know that did the discovery of Oyu Tolgoi, which is uh, obviously a very significant gold and copper um, project in 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 Mongolia. And you know we we are lucky to have Doug in, in our advisory board as well. A little bit about our capital structure, as I as I told you, we're just below. Um, uh, $12 million in cash. And these are some of the institutional investors that we have. We have Sprout Asset Management, Terra Capital, a Commodity Discovery Fund, Regal Funds, and you know a number of other institutions in, in North America. So let me let me take some time to, to tell you a little bit about our flagship pro project called Gigi. So this project sits at the heart of the Santa Laudia district which is actually one of Mexico's historically most uh, prominent silver districts. It's a district that from two mines, which you see in this slide, one to our east and the other one to our west, have produced a close to half a, million, half a billion ounces of silver, where the grade of the silver was 310 grams per ton on average, with 15% lead zinc combined. So, this is actually before the Taylor deposit, which uh, is now owned by South 32 in Arizona, was discovered. This was actually North America's largest CRD system. And you know, as, as you can see, very high grade, very high tonnage. And however, this system has a very interesting peculiarity, which is that half of the spectrum is missing and has never been found for the whole district. Actually, this uh, project was Peter Magas' uh, doctoral thesis, and it's really a deposit, uh, sorry, a system that uh, that Peter had an opportunity to study in detail. He's actually lived for almost a year in the in the mine that's adjacent to us, mapped a lot of it uh, by hand, and this is back in the in the 80s, and and essentially, all that production that I described to you has come from the system of uh, mantos and chimneys that you see in the upper part of the model. And what hasn't been discovered in, for the whole district is the SCARN, which is this area that you hear, see here in the circle. Now, just to give you a sense of uh, what we could potentially be dealing with here, in similar de deposits that are CRDs, in Mexico, there's there's a belt that goes from the center of Mexico all the way into the U.S. and then upwards to 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 Canada through British Columbia, and you see a number of CRD deposits. And you know, typically the the chimney systems will be, you know, will have about half. Uh, sorry, the scarring systems will have at least half, and sometimes more than half uh, of of the total uh, or the deposit. So you know, we're looking at, at the possibility of having in this uh, SCAR target that we're looking for, the possibility for another 50 million uh, tons of ore, you know, which could potentially be another another half a billion ounces of silver. So th this target that we're looking for is we're really looking for the possibility of, of a larger uh, a larger extension to this uh, already prolific district. There are numerous indicators that point towards the side of towards the source of the CRD at the Gigi property. Of course, uh, Max Silver did extensive work through the years that they had the the property. It was initially a, a, a very big land package, so a lot of the work that Max Silver did was reducing the the size of the land package and, and narrowing the potential source of the target. There are, uh, you can see here, a, a number of indicators uh, at surface, but also the producing mine to our east and west are a great sort of source of, of information, uh, particularly the production and the drilling that Bank Silver did in, in the project have um, all related intrusion that you see here in this, uh, in this model and points very strongly towards the source of the CRD 
being in a target area that we have identified using a number of uh, indicators at surface, but also a very sophisticated geophysics that was done by Max Siller, and which we recently had a geophysicist uh, reinterpret using modern technology. These uh, geophysics are about a decade old. And based on the geophysics, the 13 drill holes that Max Silver had done, as well as an extensive uh, mapping uh, program that we conducted over the last uh, six months, we generated uh, the drill targets, which we are now in, uh, you know, the, the permits are in process. We we were hoping to be drilling uh, uh, this month because of COVID, the permits have been uh, delayed a little bit. I'm in constant uh, contact with, uh, with the lawyers and, and we're hoping that, you know, we can get those uh, permits as soon as possible. We're already talking to our, to the drill contractors and negotiating on, on the drill contract. So as soon as that permit comes, which we think is not unrealistic to have them uh, within within the next uh, few weeks, then we'll start uh, our our drill campaign. We are scheduled to drill at least 10,000 meters, uh, potentially more, but uh, at least an initial 10,000 meters. So that's that's the, the GIGI project. And uh, I'll take a little bit of uh, time to tell you about our secondary project called Batopilas. And Batopilas is a very interesting project. It was uh, at one point Mexico's uh, highest grade uh, silver mine. It was in production until 1913, and it has a pretty fascinating history. Uh, the, the district produced about, about 300 million ounces of silver, where the average grade of the silver was about 1.5 kilos per ton. So uh, to my knowledge, there hasn't ever been a mine that produced silver at these kind of grades in, in Mexico. And it has a fascinating history because it was, uh, you know, specimens like the ones that you see in this uh, picture here started showing up in uh, museums in the US and they're just solid, um, you know, solid chunks of uh, silver. And a gentleman who was the, um, the governor of of uh, one of the U.S. states in the 1800s, you know, find about this place that had, you know, reported artisanal workings with extremely high grade silver. Moved his family there in the late 1800s and essentially started what uh, went to become uh, Mexico's uh, first uh, modern uh, modern uh, mine. And um, the what Peter Magaud did is in the 90s, after NAFTA was signed, um, American and Canadian companies again came back to Mexico to do exploration. Before that, they were not able to own um, majority stakes in, in um, exploration companies. So what Peter did is he staked the old mine, which is where the majority of those 350 million ounces of productions that the district saw came from. Um, and keep in mind the the mine didn't shut down because it was uh, depleted, but but really because of, of the war that happened in, in in the Mexican Revolution. And but what Peter did as well, which had never been done for this district, is that he claim by claim put together the entire district, which is about um, 1,300 hectares, which contains about 30 known veins, about half of them outside of the area of the old mine. All of these veins, or the majority of these veins, have historic production with grades consistent to that kilo of, uh, kilo of silver and above. And many of these have never been drilled. So we have a team that's looking at this project specifically. With the work we're doing over the next uh, few months is uh, Looking at the work that Max Silver uh, did, they did do a, uh, a little bit of drilling in this project that had some very interesting intersects. You know, a few meters of uh, a few meters that were 
higher than two kilos per ton silver with some you know very very high grade silver intersects we have one uh, intersect that had a uh, 19,000 grams per ton and then a number of other drill holes that have more moderate silver grades but what we really need to do here is have uh, new drill targets we're going to focus on doing for the for the next couple of months detail mapping channel sampling uh, chip sampling relogging uh, Max Silver's drilling, and then uh, there have been a little bit of geophysics done there. I think we might do some more, and also we have hired the Aster satellite imaging that was available for for this area. That ha it's a new satellite that started flying over Mexico, which will give us a new resolution. And based on this, we're starting a, a mapping program actually a as we speak. And the idea for this is to have drill targets. That we can start permitting, you know, within within the within this year. So, what what are the catalysts for for the company over the over the next uh, few months? We have, um, first of all, first and foremost, Gigi's drill program is is the most uh, uh, important uh, focus of the company. As I mentioned, we'll have ten thousand meters of drilling. As I mentioned as well, you know, and I think uh, Gwen touched on it as well, the main catalysts for for silver exploration company are high grade silver intersects, and I think both our properties have that potential very clearly. As I said, they both have been drilled by Max Silver and have already uh, demonstrated that potential for high grade uh, silver intersects. Um, Another catalyst is uh, consolidation of uh, the Santo Lali district. We did announce uh, an acquisition that was completed um, last uh, July, I believe. And then there is additional consolidation that we are pursuing uh, in the area close to the Gigi project. And you know, uh, do keep your eye uh, for that. And then in in uh, in Batupilas, I just explained it. The, we will start. Um, having news flow related to our, our exploration over the next uh, six months. So that's, um, that, that is, uh, in, in essence, the, our company. You know, again, we have uh, an exceptional portfolio of properties. We have, uh, obviously, one of the most successful silver exploration uh, geologists. Two, properties that have a very strong foundation and, and they give us an excellent opportunity to, to have exploration through our drilling that can show us a potential for a, for a silver uh, deposit that has high grade and, and district scale. And like I said, we're very well funded to achieve uh, the results that, that we are, uh, that, you know, that we had set out to, to achieve. So that's uh, the presentation. And, at this point, I would be uh, quite happy to take uh, any questions. Fantastic. Thanks, Jorge. Um, we can, as well as anything, we might as well just leave your presentation up because if you're answering yes. questions in some of the yes. maps or whatnot makes sense to look at, then we might as well leave yeah. that up. Probably yeah. more interesting than anybody looking at our faces anyways. Um, so I have had quite a few questions come in. If anybody yes. else has questions, please enter them into the question box there on your control panel, but I can jump right in. So let's start with uh, some jurisdictional questions. So um, what is, yeah, your your um, sense so far of the business challenges and opportunities um, working where you are in this part of Mexico? Right. So, that, you know, uh, where we're in Mexico, let me show you on the, on the map, but, you know, it's uh, Chihuahua State is, where um, our two main projects are located. And, you know, as far as Chihuahua, for those of you who have been there, it's a city that's in the north of Mexico, um, you know, maybe three hours away from the, from the border with the U.S. The closest city would be El Paso, Texas. And um, it does have an international airport, and, and our project is actually 15 minutes from the airport. And it's a pretty spectacular setting it's you know the, the highway goes right to our property and the 
basically the whole city was historically settled because of of these uh, two mines that are next to us, San Antonio and Potosi, which are uh, San Antonio's own and operated by Grupo Mexico. So we are in, um, you know, like I said at the beginning of my presentation, and specifically in this area in Mexico is is one of the, the prime areas for mining, extremely good access and and you know it's it's a mining town. The I think the vast majority of the of the town is employed by by these two mines and then other mines that are around. So there's actually a tremendous amount of uh, projects that uh, from companies that you'll be familiar with that are you know, within a couple of hundred kilometers of where we are. So it really is uh, one of the best places to be uh, in Mexico to operate. We, um, in terms of, um, of uh, what's happening with COVID, the, the mining ministry was closed from March to July. So typically with, you know, with, uh, and then, then it's been open since I think July 1st. And um, they're working normally with some um, with some uh, sort of social distancing measures, and I think they uh, maybe not not everybody works uh, from uh, from the office every day. People uh, sort of taking uh, turns, but but really operating uh, uh, normally. So we are seeing a little bit of delays, but but no, but but, but things are moving along. We. Um, are in touch obviously with the government directly through our through our legal counsel in Mexico and and I have also been uh, uh, very actively approaching other companies that have exploration projects that are close to us and sort of asking for for what's working for them in terms of uh, speeding things along with uh, you know giving the the COVID situation but really this particular this particular area is uh, obviously very safe. Uh, very easy to to access and just excellent uh, infrastructure. Okay, so security wise, um, that's not security, a security wise. This, this was very good, you know. And, and Mexico, of course, uh, has uh, some severe security challenges in some areas, but um, you know, uh, Chihuahua State is is quite good. It's, it's uh, Chihuahua, Sonora uh, are the two main states for mining in Mexico, and and security in some remote areas is an issue, but definitely not not in this particular place where we are. Our secondary asset, Batopilas, is in a more remote area, and you know security there is a little bit more of a challenge. But it's not, you know, uh, like I said, there you know we have um, uh, core mining, uh, which is a mid-tier silver producer, about 15 kilometers away from us, uh, with a production uh, producing. Uh, the mine that's actually quite big. I forget how much they produce, but one of the biggest silver mines in Mexico that's in production. They're 15 kilometers away from us, and there's just uh, dozens of uh, junior explorers uh, where we are, and everybody there uh, operating uh, normally. Okay. And then on the permitting front, it's certainly COVID yeah. obviously threw a big stumbling block in your path. I've had a few yeah. questions about since this project has been you know, being worked here and there slowly um, for such a long time. Why yes. wasn't the permitting process for this drill program started earlier? Um, yeah. And I, I would guess that has to do with refining targets, but can you yeah. shed some light no, on, on the details no, of that? That's exactly right. We we basically didn't, uh, you know, we didn't have the targets uh, when we, even when we went public. Sorry, by the time we were public, we were close to, but when we closed our financing in, which was closed about uh, about March of this year, that's really when when we had access to funds and we started the the drill program that I that I described. So that work started in March, uh, early March, and was completed in. We had our targets 100% uh, teed up in early July. So it, was, it coincided with uh, the reopening of the mining ministry and, and we did our, started our application process, um, you know, right uh, right around the end of July, we, we were, we had all, all our targets uh, defined. So that, that's, that's the reason why. Um, maybe to give everybody a sense of, um, in Mexico, it typically takes uh, about two months to get your, your drill permits. So we're already, um, 
within that that range and so um what uh, our lawyers are telling us it's you know they think uh you know it's not unreasonable to have those permits within with let's say within a month okay okay that's a good timeline estimate as best as you can ever do when it comes to things that aren't really in your control correct correct since we're talking about drilling let's keep on that vein um ha 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 play on words um let's do so, i mean a 10,000 meter drill program that's a significant number of meters can yes. you give us a little bit more um clarity on the number of targets the range of target styles that you will be geologically the range of styles that you're going to be looking at um are you going to do rc any rc drilling or will it be all diamond drilling can you just elaborate on the pl the plans for the drilling yeah no so so this is all going to be diamond drilling and you can see i mean um just see what the best one to show you um you can see the general area here in the blue with this uh, uh black dots um we're basically targeting uh the this anomaly this, this anomaly has peter um you know very intrigued it, it's never been drilled and um what if i can show you on the geological model here uh, you know what we're looking for is this scar you know, this scar could be as as long as uh, you know as a kilometer um, in length. So um, the idea for the drill campaign is to send uh, a few deeper holes, maybe 750 meters, uh, at a at a bit of an angle, and try to try to intersect both the the intrusive rock and the scar. And then once uh, that's uh, been hit, we'll um, you know we'll start uh, moving away from that, I think in in the process, you know, it's likely that we'll encounter more of these uh, chimneys, and these chimneys, to give people a sense of what those look like in the producing mines, they can be, um, you know, they can be as wide as six, seven meters wide and, and go down for, you know, 20 meters of just solid silver uh, mineralization. So Max Silver did intersect a few of these chimneys in their last uh, drill campaign at, at the Gigi property, so we expect that we'll find uh, more of those. But really, the uh, the, the big price is to find this uh, scar, which is, as I mentioned, you know, that has never been uh, found for for the whole district. And uh, so, so the idea is uh, start with some uh, deeper drill holes. The, you know, we expect the mineralization could be anywhere from 350 meters, and then down to a, to a kilometer. In the producing mine that's uh, to our east and west, mineralization starts at about 150 meters uh, from surface. And then it goes uh, all the way down to, uh, to about a kilometer. Right. Okay, that's some good clarity on that. Um, yeah, I mean, 10,000 meters uh, is a good, is a hefty program to yeah. to throw at a project for the first time. So that's exciting from an investor perspective because of the the fact that that many meters at least gives you good opportunity to to test some good, a good number yeah, of. Right. And, you know, we will we will still have, a, you know, a, a large, you know, more more than half of our cash intact, um, you know, once we completed those 10,000 meters. So it, it's. Um, uh, that's another thing that I would like to point out to to people that uh, you know we we have a an excellent shot at uh, at making a discovery here. And of course, depending on how things go at Gigi, you are advancing Batapilas as well. And there's three other four other projects in the portfolio, Correct. which is what I was speaking of before about a portfolio approach helping to mitigate yeah. exploration risk. No, and, and you know the. the we do have a, a couple of other early stage projects that I didn't mention in our portfolio. Uh, I didn't uh, discuss those, but those are um, early stage, but we did allocate a small budget that's going to be, you know, we're going to be doing early stage uh, work in there. I'm also very actively looking for JV partners for those. Um, you know, at any given time, we've had uh, side visits and, and NDAs, and, you know, if we can, um, what, not quite yet, but as soon as we figure out, um, especially the getting the, you know, a, a better understanding of what we have, you know, that's either 
either we'll advance ourselves or, or look for for JV opportunities. Gotcha. Okay, let's shift the line of questioning to um, our friend Peter McGaw. Uh, Peter is obviously the driving force behind Rain and Silver, having originally looked at this project, you know, decades ago, um, having sort of coveted it and the opportunity to explore for this SCARN and this intrusive intrusive center for the decades since. Um, I guess the two questions that I have regarding Peter are firstly, um, how much time does he have to spend with Reina? He obviously is still the chief geologist for Meg Silver. Uh, they yeah. just picked up an exploration property as well. So yeah, what's, what's Peter's uh, level of involvement? And I guess the other one is, there, I've had a few questions about, you know, Peter is so focused on a CRD model. Yeah. What if that's not the case? Have you had other experts come and look? Like, do you have, yeah, I mean, I, I know Peter quite well, but he, he, yeah, he is focused on CRD. Is there, is there a plan B geologically? Do you have other experts who have sort of given opinion? Those are two sort of disparate questions, but I'm just going to throw them both in. Good questions. So for, in terms of how much time he spends, you know, the, the agreement we have with him is he's, uh, he's doing uh, five days, uh, five days a month. And really what it, what it looks like in, in sort of practical terms is, you know, he spends a couple of hours a day uh, on, on Reina Silver, and we have a we have a technical team in Mexico that actually has been working with Peter for I think um, uh, Rene Ramirez, who's our exploration manager. I think he's been working with Peter since 1985, um, and you know he himself is one of the most uh, knowledgeable geologists uh, for CRDs. He's in in his early 60s now, and he he's full time with us as well as a team of geologists who've also been with with uh, Peter over the years. Rene is full time and I think he sends a daily report to, to Peter. I have a daily call with Rene as well. Um, and we have another gentleman, Manuel, who's the exploration manager for Batopilas, who again has been uh, um, for every drill campaign that uh, Batopilas ever did with Max Silver, he was, he was involved with that. So I think we have, uh, we're getting into a really good group where um, you know Peter um, has a very play-by-play -play overview of what's happening on the ground, but we have a very hardworking uh, and very competent team of geologists in Mexico. We do have an advisory board that, uh, as I mentioned, includes uh, Doug Kerwin, and so Doug does keep um, uh, close contact with uh, with Peter. I myself. Um, you know, send information as to as to how things are advancing, and then um, we do have a VP of exploration, who again is very very capable, who um, you know has been uh, doing uh, work in Mexico for for a long time, and who also takes a second look at at um, you know at the um, you know at, at the work that's been done, and then in terms of the CRD, I think this one is. Um, um, like pretty pretty well um, acknowledged, pretty widely acknowledged as a CRD system. There's I don't think that's uh, something that's uh, in in question. So um, so I think the um, you know the the other than than our advisory board, uh, we do have a a chairman who is um, uh, Peter Jones, who's been in the um, you know, he uh, was formerly the CEO of uh, HUD Bay. And he's a mining engineer, but somebody who has been managing exploration geology for, for decades. And um, so we do have, um, uh, you know, a constant consultation of, and, and, and review of, of, the, of the work that, that, you know, that Peter and his team are, are, are doing uh, from, from that perspective. Okay. Um, okay. Sounds good. Um, moving on, let's talk about a few details um, for, of Gigi. One person was asking whether there's any um, anything that remains from the old mines um, working yeah, yeah. or no, whatnot that are that are but, helpful um, in yeah that are helpful. No, absolutely, absolutely. So, so you know, it's uh, maybe the, the best slide you would see here. Um, 
because this is sort of what well maybe let me go back to this slide and just show you just let me show you how close we are to the mine so the san antonio mine is owned by grupo mexico and it, it's a um, it's an active mine it's at the moment is being shut down because in march they had a flooding event in one of the levels my understanding is that you know when that gets corrected it, it will go back uh, into production but just to give you a sense of uh, uh, these dots here represent the, some of the drill holes that Max Silver intersected in their drill program, I think, in 2010. And just from the edge of this property to an entrance of the of the underground mine is probably 300 meters away, so we're very close. And um, and then the Potosi mine, which is over here, it's a mine that's um, you know it's a historic mine, but uh, an Australian group. Uh, it's actively mining at the moment, and um, and again, it's only a, a few hundred meters from some of our drill targets uh, the, this season. This La Chinche uh, part of the the mine has uh, has uh, it's it's one that we that we bought in two th in uh, July of this year, and there is a small historic mine within that uh, um, you know within that uh, land package. And uh, that actually gives us a lot of information, especially showing that there's a continuity from, you know, going back to this geological model, you know, the, uh, these uh, chimneys moving into, into our area of interest. Um, again, a lot of the drilling that the, that the producing mines to our east and west have done have shown us the kind of rock that you would see typically in um, in the geological model, so so the answer is yes. I mean, there, there's a tremendous uh, amount of information that um, you know the, the number of indicators, both at surface and at depth, um, from the geophysics. Um, a, a lot of the yeah, and you know, going back to the CRD question, a lot of the geological model has been already validated by numerous uh, indicators. Right. And 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 actually, the you know the other thing that that for those of you who are not uh, super familiar with Mexico, that there is artisanal mining, um, you know, all the way from the Spanish era to modern times um, throughout our land package. And some of those, um, you know, there some of those are really small mines, that, but you can go in there and, and you know, take samples and, and, you know, do you do get a lot of very useful information. And um, mm -hmm. there's a number of those in our property. I forget how many, but, um, you know that we that has been a source of uh, information for us as well for sure old mine workings are like inside out drill holes drill holes that you can walk into when they're exactly. when they're sin. <laughs> um okay there's quite a few questions left but this call has already been almost an hour so i'm just gonna uh throw a few more over um and we'll see if we can wrap it up so that we're not stealing too much of everyone's time um how about a uh, quick answer the depth of the scarn target You've done so lots that, of geophysics, so you must have a, a thought. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. So the, I think the, the depth of the target is about 750 meters. Um, we, you know, we're going to put a long drill hole. And then you can see in, in the geological model, the expectation is that, you know, it, it wraps around the, the intrusive. And, you know, the sort of the, like I was saying in my presentation, if you look at this uh, geological model that has the producing mine here, the, the Potosi mine to our to our west, you know that mineralization starts at, at, at about 150 and goes down to a kilometer. Um, you know I, I've heard people ask Peter this question quite a few times, and I think the expectation is that the ore body would be anywhere between 350 meters and all the way down to a kilometer. That's um, and that's sort of based on on similar types of um, ore bodies uh, in Mexico and, and other parts of North America. Gotcha. Okay. Um, okay. I'm having to pick and choose here a little. So when Raina came out the gate, obviously it traded hot uh, and the share price shot up. And now we are having this free trade date um, combined with probably a bit of market weakness, creating an opportunity for entry. Uh, there's a few people asking questions about, um, you know, with drilling not yet imminent because the permit is yeah. still outstanding. Uh, somebody else also mentioned that they're seeing MAG has disclosed some selling. 
Yeah. What do you say about the near term prospects for the stock? Like if people are interested, obviously they'd like to enter at the bottom. So what can you say to that? Do you levels of interest, blocks that are moving? What do you know about Meg's interest? Uh, things like that. Yeah, no. So, so you look. It's it's been. Um, I think, I think what, what I would say is, um, you know, the the. I think the the main thing that has moved our stock um, has been silver prices because, of course, you know, we hadn't. Uh, um, you know, have any, any significant activity uh, uh, in terms of uh, exploration, and um, so I think I think that uh, we have seen a very uh, substantial uptick in in training of our stock in sort of in sync with um, with the silver price. You know, to give a sense, we went uh, public at um, I think we went public at um, when silver. So we closed our financing. The week that silver went down to twelve dollars, and then we, you know, the the company went up to, um, I mean, silver. We went public when silver was like fifteen, and then within a few weeks of going public, silver went from fifteen to I think close to thirty. So I think that has been a big driver of of the of the share movement at the moment. And then in terms of um, in terms of um, our shareholder base, uh, Max Silver did inform me that they were going to. Uh, Take some shares uh, off the market, and um, but you know, it's uh, they did explain to me that they um, you know before they go into production, they they want to be conservative with their cash, and um, you know, given the 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 everything else they had on their on their plate, they uh, they did sell a small uh, number of shares. But um, you know, one thing that's important to know is that the the majority of their shares is actually locked, so they're not able to to sell. I think uh, I think they had a maybe something like 20% of their uh, total number of shares uh, was free trading, and then uh, you know the the rest is is locked up for for two years with uh, releases every I think every six months. So I, I did call them to 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 try to understand what the thinking behind was it, and they they just uh, the answer I was given was. They are looking to, uh, you know, to to just uh, take some uh, uh, shares of of the table, but their, you know, their intention is to keep their their um, support of of Rain of Silver and to to watch our our drill progress, and to I think they still uh, own about 15% of the company. And again, they uh, what the message the West conveyed to me is that they're supportive of 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 the company and looking forward to uh to our exploration progress yeah so i mean it's impossible to know it'll depend on the market uh what happens with the market and it will i think that you know the m news of a permit and the start of drilling is likely going to help um create a bottom so I, mean, if well, you know, asking, with, I would with, sort of look at the next few uh, as an uh, open-ended sort of opportunity and it's very difficult well, to pick a bottom yeah and uh, one thing that i will mention to uh to everybody was uh you know, one thing that we did on, on our, especially on our, uh, on our pre or uh, sorry, on our RTO round, which was our, our main financing, was we were looking for, you know, to have the company to have as many shareholders that are really in the, um, uh, you know, investors because of they're looking for that potential for the discovery. So uh, we did our, our financing. Um, we, we were lucky to have a lot of institutional investors from from day one. So I think, as I mentioned, we have over 40% institutional investors. I have uh, been uh, calling them over the over the next uh, over the last few weeks, and you know the majority of them are are here really just not for the speculation, but more to to um, you know for the potential for the discovery in in both our, our properties. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know we we had a um, I would say about um, only about um, from 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 this uh, round that's uh, free trading. I would say only about maybe 25 to 30 percent came from uh, more you know retail investors, so to speak, handed with individuals in North America. The rest is sort of um, in the hands of institutional investors in in uh, North America, Europe, and 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 a Asia Pacific. So we. You know, I think I think we do have a a very strong contingent of shareholders who are um, 
you know, rec recognizing the, the, the value and the merits on, on the properties and, and the, the potential for, um, for a silver discovery that, you know, that could be significant, not just a, a small uh, mine. Absolutely. I'll just, I have one more question for you. How about you turn off screen sharing so that everyone can just uh, see us talking just for the last moment of the call here. And this is a pretty broad um, question and it's simply, what makes Reyna a um, superior speculation or investment? So you've got to go over to the control panel and turn off your, I can probably yeah. also. Well. Um, what makes Reyna a superior, Sorry, let me just. There we uh, go. Hold on. I did it. I should have just done it anyways. Okay. Uh, a superior yeah. speculation to yeah. other silver explorers, and the person specifically mentioned those who also have, you know, a good share structure and institutional yeah. support. Um, yeah. What, what do you think is the standout thing? Or yeah, I think, I think that I think that the obviously obviously Peter Magas' track record is is what it's it's one. Um, you know, number two, the the fact that we have a strong base already in terms of the work that Max Silver had done. Um, we also have, um, you know, I think that, that our cash position is also very significant because it it allows uh, it it allows for for um, you, you know the, basically the the more you drill, the the more you have a chance of making a discovery, and um, and you know the the, the one distinction that I would make is, and, and you know, I, I don't know specifically which uh, companies uh, uh, the person who asked the question will be referring to, but you know, there's sort of uh, fundamentally a, a number of companies that are pursuing, you know, what's, what's also a very valid uh, strategy, which is, you know, going for deposits that, you know, maybe were like 100 grams per ton, 200 tons per ton, 200 grams per ton on average, and other companies had a shot and maybe we're able to find 10, 20, 30 million ounces of silver. And then, you know, these people are going back and, and trying to rethink it and maybe consolidate it around and see if you can, you know, find 30 million ounces here and other 30 million ounces there. Um, and then we took a, a different approach, which is, um, you know, try, trying to look for, for a discovery that, that the older properties, uh, we've selected have the potential for, for district scale and, and being not just a small uh, mine and, and also the focus on high grade. I think a lot of, um, it's very interesting as uh, I, I've had an opportunity to travel around Mexico and look at a lot of mining projects and you know, it's, uh, it's just unbelievable the amount of uh, mining that the Spaniards did in Mexico is unbelievable. You go to town after town and you know, there's four or five historic mines. And really what happened, um, and a lot of people don't know this, but uh, Mexico was closed off for Canadian exploration and, and basically for foreign exploration uh, until NAFTA was signed in the mid 90s. So soon, as soon as the, the, the NAFTA was signed, Canadians uh, came back in. And a lot, of the, a lot of the discoveries that make, you know, First Majestic, Endeavor Silver, Pan American, all these, all these discoveries were really around what I would call the easy pickings, which were you know, historic Spanish vintage mines that, um, you know, where the, a lot of the vein was exposed and had been already mined. And so they, they, were for, they went for that. And then, you know, we, since 2010 to now, there's been very little money spent in exploration because obviously silver has been, uh, you know, pretty much at a, at a price that was not very attractive. And uh, so there, you know, Properties like the ones we have are, are fantastic because you know have the possibility for a for a brand new discovery. When you look at the level of of discoveries, like when you go across the border to uh, to Nevada, uh, uh, New Mexico, Arizona, you know the, we're Mexico in terms of exploration. While we have 500 years of production, in terms of exploration, we're probably 60 years behind. So there's still a lot of uh, a lot of exploration to be done. Um, and especially with, um, you know, using geophysics and uh, like, like I said, a lot of the, the mines that you are familiar with that are in Mexico were discovered really um, following uh, old Spanish uh, workings. 
Well, I think we can leave it there. Um, thanks, Jorge, for taking the time to walk us all through the Reina Silver story and the near-term things to look forward to um, as that story really gets going. And thank you certainly to everyone who tuned in today to, uh, to listen. We appreciate the audience. We appreciate your interest. If you need any more information from Reina or if you have any questions for me, we're all very easy to find. You can search Raina Silver's website um, or you can search for resourcemaven.ca and we'll, we'll, we would both be very happy to entertain any questions that you might have. And with that, everyone, um, I think we will call it a day. Thanks again and we'll see you all back here again soon, I'm sure. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.